Welcome to Working From Home Conversations with the End Slavery Collective. Um, today we have the great Luke de Pulford from Arise Foundation. And um, Luke, please tell us a bit about how you've been during this time and what's been going on for you and a bit about Arise. So Arise's mission is to try to confront the problem of slavery through frontline organizations. And we work a lot through small civil society groups around the world um, I guess if there's something distinctive about the way that we approach this without being faith-based, but very faith-friendly. So we recognize the power of faith actors in communities to change things in their communities. So we, we're open to working with them as much as possible. So our day-to-day -day business is really just listening to those guys who are trying to do the best work for their communities, um, who have the trust of those communities, who can help try and bring them through tough times, which is uh, why we knew relatively early that what was happening with lockdown for them was going to be like truly calamitous. We were looking at a disaster and uh, we had to change really all of our operations overnight to pivot to becoming an emergency fund, um, which is all we've done for the last nine weeks, um, which has been difficult, not, not just difficult because we've just had to learn how to do a new thing. Like we're not set up to give emergency grants and we've done, well over 80 of them. It's been difficult because, you know, as a charity like ours, you can't feed everybody. You know, we can't feed the whole of India. We're, we're not big enough. Um, and we made a decision early on that we were going to try to help the people that we were already helping. So the communities that we were serving, if they were struggling with the possibility of famine, which was definitely the case in India and in some other countries too, that we would try to give those people the food that they needed, the essentials that they needed through lockdown. And I guess that meant that we were getting a lot of requests from people that we couldn't help and very desperate requests, and that's not easy um, at all. So there has been some real difficulty, but on the plus side, it's been tremendously uh, life-affirming and also affirming of this model. I mean, we're not the only people in the anti-slavery movement who try to work through frontline groups. Um, and what we realized through this is well, without those groups, we have no hands, nobody else could get through to them. You know? And because they were embedded in those communities, these people have been for a long time, they, could, they have the trust of police, they have the trust of civic institutions and could actually do stuff. They could actually get supplies to people who needed them with permission. So it's been really affirming of that model, I suppose, but also of the, phenomenal sacrifices that people make uh, locally to serve their communities. That's a, a very beautiful thing. Um, but it doesn't take away from the difficulty of just facing what is a humanitarian crisis, which is yet to peak in India. Oh, I see. So you're saying effectively now that famine has become the, one of the main things that's, that's causing such big issues and that modern slavery will be sort of almost second to that in a way because that will then that'll then happen in, in a few months time after lockdown's released well yeah i think it's a complex picture so there are certain forms of enslavement and exploitation which have uh, spiked in this period particularly online sexual exploitation of children uh, tragically from the data that we've got we know that there's been a big spike in it um, but a lot of the normal methods of exploitation require transport and movement, which hasn't been possible. So weirdly, we're in a situation where there hasn't been that much of that, um, or those normal kinds of exploitation, if you like. Um, what I mean in terms of the, the peak is that I think India, certainly India and some other countries too, have not yet got to the point where they've reached the, the peak of the outbreak. Right. And um, there are very large migrant populations all over the world who have moved from one place to another for work. Um, with lockdown, that income stream is dead. They have no money at all, no job security, can't go home because they're in lockdown. Only now are they starting to return home, but because there's no money being remitted back to their communities, which is what they were doing with their work, um, they've gone back to real social unrest. So the situation really is quite desperate. I mean, what we're saying, what the message that Arise is trying to get out there is that the real risk period for modern slavery will be after lockdown. Um, the reason being that 
as the world economy starts to move slowly um, back into the normal running of things, the release from lockdown will move much faster than the economic recovery, basically. Right. And so, what do you think, Luke, are some of the biggest lessons we're going to learn from lockdown? Uh, I mean, that's a very tough question to answer because there are so many. I think there are a lot of cultural lessons. Um, I think people are going to behave a bit differently because of this. Um, but I think in terms of our world, the world that we're trying to work in, the, the anti-slavery world, there's one clear message that comes through to me, which is that these guys at the front line, you know, they are always going to be needed. We don't do a good enough job of listening to them. We don't do a good enough job of supporting them. And I think that this crisis has really underlined that without them, there was nothing that we could do. Yeah. So I hope that after this period, we'll all stand back and say, look, we have designed a way of doing this work, which sometimes makes it really hard for people at the front line to get support. They have to do things like write really tough proposals and sort of uh, produce a load of data. They're not necessarily equipped to do that, but their work is very important. We need to find ways of supporting them. I hope that that is the key lesson that comes out of this. I know that there is um, definitely some movement around that within our community. People are realizing we can't do this stuff at a distance. We have to have people in communities who are building resilience, who are building trust. And that's the way that we're really gonna affect this thing long-term. So I'm hopeful about that. I think there are, there are other lessons too. Uh, companies and companies' responsibilities to their workers. We've found out that when the bottom line is threatened, the first people who will suffer will be the people who produce the goods. Um, and we've seen that some companies have been called out for it, you know, not um, fulfilling their contractual obligations to people, particularly if they're on very um, weak or short-term contracts or no contracts, which is often the case. Um, what I would say is that the most egregious example of that is uh, probably in Western China right now with the Uyghurs, um, where you have a program of uh, what can only be described as state-sponsored slavery on a mass scale. Um, and the difficulty there is that there's a lot of forced labor and a lot of those Uyghurs who are producing things which we consume. So they're, they're Turkic Muslims, um, and there are about a, a million of them in what, uh, well, the Chinese government calls uh, re-education camps. Wow. Um, many of them have moved to other parts of the country um, in order to labor. Uh, we recently had a very, very wonderful decision by the uh, British Cotton Association to stop sourcing cotton from Xinjiang, which is the area where they are for that very reason. Um, so I hope that there will be some recognition, more recognition of the fact that the goods that we get, someone has to produce, you know, we've kind of realized that through this period um, because we haven't had access to the things that we might normally have. They all come from somewhere and we depend upon people to get things. And I, I think that can only be a good thing as we move towards a space where people are a bit more uh, corporately accountable, where we have people in business who really think about their employees. Thank you for that. That's really, really illuminating about, about that perspective. Thank you. You guys do a lot of work in India, but perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with the Roma communities in Albania. I'd love to hear about that. Sure. Well, uh, the, you know that Albania is one of the principal source countries for people who are sexually exploited in the UK. Um, and because Arise's focus is in prevention work, you know, we're trying to turn off the tap really of the flow of people who are coming to the UK and other countries. Um, we want to work in Albania, we want to do what we can to strengthen local communities to protect their communities from exploitation. And the communities that are especially vulnerable there are particularly the Roma communities, the Roma and Egyptian communities, which are um, generally speaking on very, very weak uh, situations of employment. So they will be on daily wage em employment or they'll be unemployed. Um, and they also live in very close-knit communities, which can mean that uh, they're difficult to help and penetrate from the outside very often. So those communities were rendered profoundly vulnerable again by this virus because of lockdown, because you've got daily wage earners who aren't getting any wage. Well, what are they gonna do? They're gonna find themselves more desperate. When they're more desperate, there are gonna be people around to exploit them very sadly. And we've seen in Albania, um, or at least what we're hearing from the front line, a lot of loan sharks, for example, going around and giving people exploitative loans. Um, and when those people can't pay those loans back, 
we know what will happen. They will be forced to pay them back in other ways. Um, so that I think is, a, is sadly a pattern uh, that we see in Albania. Um, but Albania has an amazing network of frontline organizations. Again, chronically under-resourced, um, but amazing, can do so much. So we've been working with them to build up those communities through those organizations, um, which, which we think really deserve a seat at the table they should be listened to. And what, what countries do you work in? How many countries do you work in? It's about 11 in total. Um, have you found one country is more in need right now than others, or are you working across like all hours of the day with everyone? Wow, well, I mean, I would say that um, the need is very different. So in India, the need, you know, the internal migration in India is so huge that you've got massive migrant populations going from one area to another, and those entire populations which represent, I mean, millions of people are extremely vulnerable. It's very different to the Philippines, um, which is another country that we work in. So I'll give you an example. It's about 10% of the entire economy of the Philippines is remittances. So people who are working abroad sending money back. And a lot of the people who've been working abroad have simply been repatriated. There is no work. Right. Now, if you repatriate somebody who no longer has an income, who may have been exploited, by the way, in the country that they went to, and then their family also has no income and you send them home, what do you think is gonna happen? hugely increased vulnerability, hugely more at risk, which is what has been happening in, in the Philippines, is dreadfully worrying. Um, and the difficulty with the lockdown in the Philippines is it was so harsh that mm. NGOs couldn't actually work. It's got a bit better now. We learned last week, we learned last week that there were 1.1 million Sri Lankans displaced through COVID. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is an aspect of the lockdown that it's been hard for us to see because we're so concerned with what's going on here. It's hard for us to look beyond our own threshold. You know, everybody suffered with this, uh, just in varying degrees. But the suffering, I mean, the suffering of a young woman who moves to the Middle East as a domestic worker to send money home and then gets repatriated and finds herself in a very exploitative situation and cannot provide for her family. I mean, that is truly dreadful suffering. And that's ongoing right now. Do you find that um, Europe's reaction with the effect of COVID is different, is, is very much different to what's happening, you know, further afield? I think it varies hugely. Um, it, it really does. Uh, some countries have taken a really hard line on it. India took a very hard line very early on, considering their rates of infection. But they were right to do that because the well, the ability of the country to provide medical services is comparatively small compared to you know, more, more developed nations. So they took a really hard line on it. And I can see why they did it. You can understand the rationale. But it didn't go along with the kind of social protection and provision needed for those migrant communities that were going to be exposed. Um, and we've seen the effect of that, you know, uh, dealing with it all the time. I mean, it's all ours. Um, me and uh, our programs director, Jess, and, and others in the team, constant through stream of really desperate pictures and messages saying, this is what we're dealing with, pictures of kids who are carrying all the possessions on their backs, trying to make it home, and really weeping with hunger. It's not a pleasant thing to see, but that is the situation in India. Um, some other countries haven't taken that approach at all. It's, it, and it's interesting because we kind of don't know enough about the behavior of this virus to know who was right yet. Um, Luke, we always like to end on a story of hope and we'd love to hear some positive stories from you either during this time in COVID or during your time with the rise um, so that we can end on a high. Let me tell you a, a, a really lovely and wonderful story. Um, so we work a lot through Religious Sisters, one of these faith communities that we think are amazing. I mean, they're huge. There's so many of them in the field. Um, and so many of them do great work, don't get paid, um, give their lives to it, you know. And last time I was in uh, Assam, Northeast India, there was a sister there who sort of took me over to just a group of papers that she collected. She's an amazing woman, you know, she, she'd had a double mastectomy and she was still working away for her communities. Um, and she said, do you know, I've got some evidence. Do you think you'd be able to find an academic who would be able to analyze it for me? I'm like, well, what is it? thinking that this was some kind of crazy harebrained scheme. And she showed me a page, which was a detailed record of a domestic worker 
So she'd just ask questions like, where are you from? What are you doing? Um, and things like, what's the attitude of your employer towards you? Now, because she's trusted by these people, they were giving really honest answers. And I thought, well, this is interesting. How many records have you got? She said, 11,000. Um, wow. Sorry, what? 11,000? To my knowledge, this is the largest data set of domestic workers in the world. So I took this to a, a mutual friend of ours, a guy called Kevin Bales, who you know, Professor Kevin Bales, and said, I think I've stumbled upon a massive data set on domestic workers. Are you interested? It's like, am I interested? Yeah. So Nottingham is now analyzing um, and producing a report around this fantastic data set, huge data set, from this kind of little old sister in the middle of nowhere that we just stumbled across. A really rich, beautiful data that's going to teach us about domestic workers. And I, I leave you with that because I think it, there are many stories to tell, but I think that one underlines a point here that, you know, had Arise not been trying to really listen to these groups, and amplify them, give them a voice, there's no way that we would have discovered it. We don't know what's there when we really scratch the surface and, and give them the platform, give them the voice that they need. I think also something that you mentioned earlier about how, as you say, like we couldn't have done anything without these people. It's kind of similar if you look at what the response in England has been with our frontline NHS and our postman, our binman, you know, all the people that we really wouldn't have been able to survive without. And, you know, I think it's such an important message um, to share with people. So I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think what people are realizing about slavery is that without resilient communities, we will not end it. And those people on the front line are our hands, they're our feet, they're, they're our hearts, they're our love for those people. We cannot do this work without them. Thank you so much, Luke, for your time. I know that you're an incredibly busy man with two children, one on the way, and your wife is the doctor, and I don't know how you're keeping the trains running right now. So it's very, very impressive. To summarize for our listeners, I think the key takeaway from today's conversation with Luke is that it's gonna be after lockdown that human trafficking really needs everyone's help. As businesses reopen and there's a rat race to get back to normal life, that's when we need to be as aware as ever and keep our eyes open and help our communities. I think also, Luke, you made a very good point around COVID and exposing those most vulnerable in the supply chain and it being those people actually producing our goods that are the ones that are getting the most hurt and the ones that can take it the least. Thank you both for doing this. Honestly, you guys are great and you're doing such a wonderful job at cohering this movement, bringing people together. Thank you for what you do. Thank you.